Hi, everybody. This is Anthony Gross, host of The Sales Lab. Welcome to today's program. Today, we're going to be talking about the health of the housing market, and we're going to be discussing housing affordability, the economy, and buyer sentiment. My guest today is Jeff Tucker, Senior Economist with Zillow. I'm excited to have Jeff on our program because of the work he has done in the U.S. housing market and also his focus on new construction. So let's get into it. Jeff, welcome to our program. Thanks, Anthony. It's great to be back. You know, you and I were on air about six months ago, and boy, a lot has changed. I went, th <laughs> I went through and I wrote a list. I'm like, okay, what, what has changed with housing or with buyers or the economy in the last six months? So here's my list, okay? Mortgage rates have increased nearly three points in six months. That means home payments, principal and interest, a monthly housing payment is up nearly 40% just on mortgage rates. We continue to see prices increase. I think the last report I saw was 21% in the past 12 months. Uh, oh, inflation. Inflation is at a 40-year high. I, I'm laughing because the other day I spent $100 to almost fill up my car. The pump stopped before my car got <laughs> full. Um, and that has to be dragging on people. We have a stock market that's been extremely volatile. Um, don't look at your retirement statement. Um, and, and now we have buyer sentiment, and this is based on Fannie Mae's National Housing Survey. That's at an all-time low, lower than in, in the history of the survey, which started in 2010. We continue to also hear about an impending recession. And by the way, I just read a Freddie Mac study that was released a few months ago that there's 54 million mortgage ready or near mortgage ready buyers under 45 who want to buy a home. So we have a confluence of ideas and factors impacting housing. From your seat, what's the current health of our housing market? The housing market had a fever and that fever has broken. The big question is just how far in the other direction the housing market is going to swing. Um, so when, when I say that there was a fever, we had just frenzied activity, multiple offers, uh, homes selling faster than they've ever sold before, national median days to pending of under a week at times, even just earlier this spring. Um, a lot of those factors are beginning to swing the other direction. You mentioned price appreciation. Mm -hmm. especially our like raw monthly, our, our, our most real-time measure of price appreciation, mm -hmm. that turned the corner, that's coming down. And finally, our annual price appreciation, you mentioned 21%. That's about what we're seeing on the Zillow Home Value Index. It matches up with you know what we, what we hear from Case Shiller and CoreLogic. Mm -hmm. um, our annual price growth has also turned the corner. It's begun to decline for the first time since the pandemic began. So you know, buyers got pushed and it was like the housing market was just pushing buyers to see how far they could go and finally found their breaking point where, where buyers are stepping back. Um, and as they do, we start to see a lot of these dynamics in the market build in the other direction. So instead of record low falling inventory, inventory is beginning to climb and in some markets climbing very rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. and meanwhile, sales are also taking a step back. So, you know, from a market that was so feverish, that was very unhealthy. Um, things are changing and there's a potential to kind of come out of this in a more balanced, healthy state. Uh, but kind of getting from point A to point B is a painful transition. It's, it's painful for some potential first time buyers feeling priced mm -hmm. out. And that transition, that slowdown is painful for industry participants. If, if your business, uh, whether it's lending or uh, brokerage, uh, if it depends on volume, um, mm -hmm. those volumes are down and, and, and that will be painful. But uh, I think in the medium run, where we could end up is a bit more of a balanced market where buyers are not just subjected to this insane rat race of, you know, making offers with no contingencies, paying way over list, buying sight unseen. Hopefully some of those very unhealthy requirements to buy a home in many markets mm -hmm. will be a thing of the past pretty soon. Yeah, I, and we definitely are seeing it in our data. And as we were discussing prior to coming on air, 
you know, we've seen a pretty significant decline over the last six months as interest rates have risen, a significant decline in new home purchase applications, which is my business, but purchase applications in general. So is that decline what we're talking? I mean, when we talk about the fever breaking uh, and maybe a little deflating of demand, is that related? Is that decline really housing affordability impacting the market? I think housing affordability is the main culprit. Um, we we see really similar numbers when we do kind of a, a think about that same home one year ago, what it, the price and the mm -hmm. interest rate, and then just compare that to today. That means that principal and interest for that mortgage payment is up about sixty percent in most markets mm -hmm. in the country. So a lot of buyers who had some sense of you know, okay, I can afford a, a twenty five hundred dollar mortgage payment that should get me a home in the ballpark, uh, you know, a three bedroom home in on this block in this neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. that's out the door. That's just, the, those homes are up, that mortgage payment is up 60%. So that $2,500 mortgage payment just doesn't buy nearly as much as it used to. So a lot of buyers are stepping back and saying, what can I afford? Maybe it's, it's nothing that meets my needs right now. Maybe it's nothing that meets my needs in this market. And I need to mm -hmm. think about, moving from Seattle to Spokane, or I, I, I need to think about moving from New York to Florida. Um, not, you know, a lot of people have made, already made that type of move, but it may be more of a necessity uh, for some people to go buy that first home in the near term. So I'd say mm -hmm. that buyer pullback in the face of affordability is the, the biggest uh, proximate cause of the cool down. And when we look at that rising inventory, that can either be because more, more of a flow of new listings is hitting the market mm -hmm. or a weakened flow of sales pulling homes off the market. And if, when we kind of disaggregate that, it's almost entirely due to weaker sales. It, it's not that there's a flood of like distressed sellers just dumping homes. The, that, that flow is staying very similar. But as the flow of sales uh, uh, shrinks down, we start to see that reservoir of active listings kind of fill back up. Yeah. Now, now, is it filling up at a rate that will approach uh, a balanced market, in your opinion? I mean, I, see, I hear comments about year over year or month over month inventory change. You know, it's up 18 percent. But when you have less than one month's inventory, 18 percent change or 20 percent change might get you to 1.2 months. Um, are, are we seeing it uh, moving quickly? And, and is there is there a level like what we used to think six months is, is there a level of inventory that is a balance? Uh, that's a great question. It's um, th this is one part of one, one metric for the market that's really diverging around the country mm -hmm. where some, I, I'd say uh, th there are several markets, kind of certain regions where inventory is up sharply um, up more than 40%, especially in, I'd, I'd say sort of, out west, um, mm -hmm. and in particular, actually, the inland west is is up even sharper in general than the coastal west. So, places like Spokane, uh, Boise, and it turns out Las Vegas right now is leading is at the leaderboard for uh, we see inventory in the, just the last couple of weeks, right around the beginning of July. Inventory was up there by over sixty percent year over year, and wow. up in here in Seattle. Uh, up over 40% year over year. Phoenix as well also has, has a major rise. Um, so some of these markets that were, in fact, some of the hottest during the pandemic, kind of the inland west, um, as well as just ones that are always very expensive, Seattle and San Francisco, um, they are seeing inventory move back into what I think uh, could approach kind of a more balanced range very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Nationwide, we're closer to just breaking even year over year, just roughly flat, maybe up slightly year over year. So uh, long story short, th this is something where different parts of the country are approaching balance at very different rates. And then finally, I think our, you know, it's, I, I do think it's important to, to phrase things in terms of, you know, months of inventory, because I'm not sure we're ever going to go back to the days of median time to pending sale of multiple weeks, you know, four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that's something really striking actually, is that even, even as the market is kind of cooling down, that that median days to pending is still s staying very fast. I, I think agents and home shoppers have gotten used to kind of moving quickly. And, you know, I, I, I do think technology plays a role. People can 
get a better sense and filter down their options quicker using the online tools now. You know, I'll mention Zillow uh, plays a role in that. And uh, a lot of the technology that our partners and our competitors have been rolling out to help people shop for a home more thoroughly uh, from their uh, from their own home. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing that as well. I mean, buyers, you know, were online. The pandemic accelerated that technology use and adoption. And behaviorally, uh, for the buyers today, everybody is online doing their research, right? So that's exactly what you're talking about. We're used to that that environment to select our, you know, select what we're purchasing, setting up our appointments. So speaking of that, you know, with affordability really slamming the market and deflating demand and taking some buyers to the sideline. Personally, I don't think buyers have gone away. I, I still think they're there. They may not be taking the steps forward, but how has uh, online traffic uh, changed in the last few months or just activity in general uh, with the sharp rise or decline in affordability? Uh, when I take a look at site traffic at Zillow, I can say it has diminished. Um, it, it, it's kind of cooled off from earlier this spring, especially in kind of late Q1 was part of that fever. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's cooling off a bit. Um, another metric that that where I can get, be a little more precise is sharing what showing time is seeing, which Zillow acquired and they published a national uh, index of mm -hmm. how many showings are actually happening. It's still a, a, a good kind of down funnel metric of purchase demand. Nationally, those were down, showings were down about 18% year over year in May. Mm -hmm. But again, that had huge regional variation from the Northeast, which was a bit less than that, more like 12% down year over year to the mm -hmm. West and out West showings were down 45% year over year in May. Um, which, you know, the, the West is the most expensive region. And mm -hmm. I think that that figures into this into this theory that affordability is what's slamming the brakes here. Yeah. And, and those are interesting facts that you're sharing with us, because I'm hearing uh, from my data sources, uh, some service providers that host different sites around the country, you know, while activity is down, um, it's not down as far as uh the showings the sales and other things now of course that's it, it depends on the region that you're in so to me that tells me that buyers are out there but they're not taking the next steps right you know right now so clearly we're starting to see or we are seeing affordability become a major factor uh for buyers out there and based on the amount of calls i get and questions about you know creating affordability it, it is an issue and i think it's going to be an issue for a while um, as the market normalizes and as we get into, uh, you know, how the economy is doing in interest rates, but that's another discussion we'll get into, um, with affordability, you know, a question I had for you, uh, Jeff was with affordability, if buyers are slowing their purchase decision, let's call it that if I'm slowing my purchase decision and I'm, are, are buyers starting to choose renting versus buying? due to affordability issues and i'll give you just a little background here if so is renting in just your opinion if so is renting actually better you know for the buyer the reason is is i can make a strong argument that it's not rent versus buy it's buy versus rent because rents are escalating so quickly so a little backdrop there to the question but you know are we are you seeing a shift uh buying uh buyers choosing to rent right now I think that is the most common alternative for where those would be buyers are ending up that that's harder mm -hmm. to kind of track down. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the, the story of the dog that didn't bark that the person who didn't buy a home, where exactly are they right now? Um, I think renting is, is the best guess though. And that's one reason that the rental market is still seeing vacancy rates near 40 year lows. Uh, there are a lot of things in the economy right now where we have to harken back to the early 80s to find a comparison. Rental vacancy rates are very, very low. That is pushing up rent growth, mm -hmm. which kind of peaked around 16% earlier, just in the last few months earlier this year. So that, you know, rent versus buy, that I think we all know that depends a lot on your personal circumstances, how long you want to be in that home. There's still always in every region, there, there's kind of a different 
selection of housing stock that are available <laughs> to rent versus buy. So you'll have a lot more selection in the purchase market if what you really want is a detached home with several bedrooms and it, you know, the white picket fence and everything. Um, so what I will say is that calculation, you know, that 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 decision, what has tilted strongly against buying. Uh, that, that doesn't mean no one should buy. It means whatever that that the kind of relative costs and benefits were, it's tilted uh, strongly against buying uh, relative to renting in the last several months, just because of this huge change in interest rates that radically changes the cost of home ownership. And actually, we just crossed this, this interesting threshold where our national rent index for the first time ever is a little bit cheaper, a little bit lower than the principal and interest typical on a typical mortgage payment at our national price index level and just you know an average 30 year mortgage rate that's never happened before and looking around the country even one year ago even in december the majority of major metro areas had this uh had this amazing fact where a typical mortgage payment was less than our rent index in each of them that also flipped this spring so that now the vast majority, over 40 out of the 50 biggest metro areas, actually have a typical rent level somewhat less than the typical monthly mortgage payment. That's yeah. just kind of a rule of thumb, just kind of a, a one interesting kind of threshold, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it shows how much things have shifted around the country. Yeah, and I, you know, um, the escalation in home price was camouflaged by historically low interest rates. And, and that's what caused that inversion. Like you said, for so long, that buying made, made way more sense. And what most people don't realize is interest rates are far more powerful at creating as well as taking away housing affordability than price. But when you have them synchronized, mortgage rate increases along with high price, it erodes purchasing power very quickly. And we, we've seen that actually the Atlanta Fed publishes a housing affordability study uh, that's fascinating where they break down the components of affordability, price appreciation, mortgage payment, and then the offset is your income. And so they have a visual representation of it. It doesn't make you feel any better, but it, it's a great way to explain uh, that impact. That's so let's a great index. I, I love the Atlanta Fed's homeownership affordi uh, affordability monitor. Um, and it, <laughs> yeah, it it's striking. It is jaw dropping when you look at that, just the the erosion of affordability this year. Yeah. And it's a great visualization. So for all of you nerds out there, well, you can contact me and I'll send you the link to that one. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty cool to, to, and they update it every month as well. So we're, let's talk just a little bit about inflation. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but you know, on the lending side, we look at people's incomes and expenses. We don't look at the rest of their bills, but how important from your seat, how important is controlling inflation or how is inflation really impacting the housing market or, or housing demand? Inflation has been eating up more and more of people's paycheck. I, I think people have a better sense this year of how much smaller their truly kind of disposable income is after mm -hmm. covering a lot of necessary expenses, including gas and groceries um, and you know their, their car payment. That leaves less left over for that monthly mortgage payment uh, as they're considering what to buy. And I, th I think in the bigger picture, you know, inflation also figures into both the monetary policy. We know the Fed has, you know, has has really tipped the scales now from mm -hmm. accommodative to kind of contractionary monetary policy to try to get that genie back in the bottle. So inflation we know kind of contributes to that tighter monetary policy leading to these higher mortgage rates. Um, further, you know, that that 30 year fixed rate mortgage we all obsess about, that's a nominal figure. And so lenders and, you know, market participants are kind of combining some expected inflation with the, the, the kind of real cost of credit in there, both of which have gone up a lot this year. And so inflation kind of directly feeds into expected inflation kind of directly feeds into that 30 year mortgage rate. So that's, I think, one of the culprits this year. So it's unfortunately in, in the short term, 
uh, it's a double whammy where both the higher inflation and the reaction to it are stacking up to this higher mortgage rate. I, I'd say the the one bit of good news in the last month or so is last couple of months, we've started to see those market-based expectations for inflation, the, the implied expected inflation over the next five to 10 years from the break-even that, that's implied uh, from securities, from, from bonds, that's been coming down. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the best news that we seem to have turned the corner. I, th there could be a few corners in this hallway, but we've turned one corner of declining more uh, declining inflation expectations, which could be a good sign that, that the Fed's strong June statement, the, the minutes from that FOMC meeting, the 75 basis point rate increase, uh, all contributed to a sense that the Fed is uh, going to do what it takes to bring down inflation. That has translated into lower inflation expectations. Maybe, just maybe, that's also we, we are, we've already seen that translate into lower 10 year yields. Maybe that's also translating into a bit of easing up and kind of turning the corner on mortgage rates. You're you're the expert on the mortgage rate, so I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't know. Do I? I boy, I, I I would be so trouble. I would be so scared. Oh, no, you're fine. Getting, you're fine. Uh, you're, you're... Mortgage backed securities or, or any kind of securities based on some forecast of mortgage rates right now. But from a late, you know, from a uh, I, I don't know, from from an amateur's perspective here, looking at that side of the market, I for the first time this year, the, the last couple months of really the last month of break even inflation data is giving me a little bit of cause for hope that mortgage rates could could have stopped climbing or even come down a bit. Yeah. And 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 trust me, I still have a job because I'm not good at telling where interest rates are going. But, you know, rates rise. The, the, the market has been irrational. The Fed has been selling uh, their mortgage backed securities, which actually pushes rates higher, has quit buying them, which they did for many years. So there's a lot of upward pressure there. But a lot of the market was irrational. And as you said, as inflation get come, becomes clear, we should see a stabilization and potentially a pullback. Um, I'm not counting on a significant drop anytime soon, but stability and calm will go a long way uh, to normalizing interest rates. And, and that will help because I think the, va the rapid increase sends a shock into the system, sends a shock through the buyers. And more importantly than anything, we need buyer sentiment to be good. They need to be positive about owning a home and they need to feel confident about where rates are and what they can afford. So speak, speaking of that, the other big specter that's out there is all this discussion about recession. Now, you're the senior economist. I just have an undergraduate in economics. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, do I even care about a recession? And here's here's my thought process on this. So do I care about a recession when employment is still very strong and unemployment rates are still low, uh, personal balance sheets of the consumer still very strong. Yes, they're spending less on services, but it, it, it isn't a credit stressed buyer as it was 15 years ago. So should we care about, the, or, you know, I guess I'll start with this. What is a recession <laughs> and should we care about this? Yeah, in incredibly, a recession doesn't have a simple formula. It's uh, it's determined retrospectively by a little committee of economists, the Business Cycle Dating Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, which is mm -hmm. a great institution that, that also just publishes tons and, and finances tons of economic research. They have a small committee that retrospectively goes back and assesses um, a recession as I, I had to look this up just to make sure I got it is a significant <laughs> decline in economic activity that's spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months. So it, it needs to be kind of deep and diffuse and f longer than just like instant longer than just a blip. Um, so, you know, people do look at did real GDP fall for two quarters in a row is unemployment rising? Those are major indicators that are going to help kind of answer that question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thanks to this very rapid rise in inflation, the the actual kind of nominal, decently strong growth in GDP is 
canceling out basic, basically to nearly zero real GDP growth at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned those, those other factors like consumer household balance sheets, uh, consumer spending, because a lot of these, these other, a lot of those factors in the economy are looking rather strong. So uh, there, there's still some very strong ac economic activity out there. And there's, uh, so all in all, I, I, I think there's still a chance for what might be called a soft landing of getting inflation back under control, but without actually pushing the economy into a deep recession with lots of unemployment, major slowdown in economic output and spending. Um, it, well, we'll see, you know, forecasting that is, is very difficult, but certainly for the impact on the economy, I think, uh, sorry, for the impact from the economy onto the housing market, I think some of the analogies would be, you know, some of the better analogies would be earlier recessions, like the 2000, 2001 recession, um, or even further looking even further back into the eighties and nineties because rather than the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, 2010, because that one really was driven by the housing market. It's driven by a credit crisis that originated in mortgage-backed securities. Uh, so it was not surprising that the housing market suffered unusually greatly during that time. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, you know, if we do get a recession that if, it, if it, even if it's uh, even if it happens, if it turns out to be fairly modest, and brings inflation back under control, creates a little bit of breathing room to relieve some of the bottlenecks in the economy. That could that could sort of bring us back to a happy medium and that kind of balanced housing market uh, without super high inflation and interest rates sooner rather than later. Um, that so for folks in the industry, those are some silver linings or kind of things to think about. Uh, Certainly on the flip side, more people unemployed or losing their jobs is not a good thing. Uh, and I think what the Fed is trying to do is to thread that needle of relieving some of those bottlenecks, bring down inflation, but without necessarily laying off millions of people. I'm, I'm glad I don't have the job of trying to thread that needle right now. Well, I wish Jerome Powell lots of luck. Um, that's a very difficult task. And I do agree with you that a slowdown will help. Uh, hopefully it will help with supply chain, but more importantly, you know, wage growth, a tight wage market really, in my opinion, is additive to inflation. So a little slowdown uh, could be a good thing overall for us. But uh, for me, and this is just my opinion, uh, as long as even if we have a, a, a retraction a, a pullback in the economy, as long as we have inflation, we're not going to see the Fed ease on their interest rate policy a lot. So, you know, we need to definitely see that inflation number uh, begin to roll over and uh, slow down for us. That would be great. So final question, Jeff. Um, we I ask this to you all the time. Uh, are we going to see a big housing market correction or significant price declines? I mean, what is that look like in this current environment going forward for the next 12, 24 months? I don't think so. I What our forecast model is predicting right now, and which jives with my own kind of intuition looking at the data, is a plateau is very likely for price levels. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that rate of price growth could slow way down, maybe to basically flatlining to flat year over year growth. Uh, we're predicting flat monthly growth next spring at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but the substantial declines, we, I just don't see where they would be coming from sellers, uh, you know, home prices tend to be downward sticky, which means people really don't like cutting their prices. Uh, they, they mm -hmm. don't like selling a home for less than they bought it for unless they have to. Uh, and so what really provided the fuel for the fire, uh, and sent, things in a downward spiral in 2007, 2008, 2009 was foreclosures. It, it was people mm -hmm. who had no choice but to sell uh, or, you know, who gave up their, you know, who lost their home. The bank, the lender had to sell that home. They don't mind taking a loss. They need to get it off their books. They, that's part of where the 20% down payment comes from is expecting to take a haircut on a foreclosure auction. Right. That was kind of contagious and helped push prices down all over the place. Um, but we don't have much reason to expect that right now. 
folks who have been buying homes have sterling credit. 90 plus percent of them have been getting plain vanilla, fully amortizing fixed rate mortgages. So they won't have those huge balloon resets, balloon payments. Um, and those are the kinds of things that pushed people into foreclosure, uh, forced all these sales where people didn't mind selling at a loss. Um, that kind of fuel is not there to burn right now. So, you know, in terms of prices, I think kind of flatlining could very well happen. If inflation remains, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine percent, you could also argue, I mean, definitionally, that would actually mean sort of real home prices have could be kind of declining. And in mm -hmm. fact, that that might um that might give kind of a little wiggle room for the housing market to have this effective kind of cool down, technically, you know, declining real prices, even though nominal prices don't decline. Uh, just in a context of uh, of other things having inflation. Um, that's kind of what we are expecting at this point. And when we step back and think about the medium term, the other reasons, uh, so setting aside sort of that the credit quality of existing homeowners, the other factors here are we still just didn't build that many homes in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And we have this huge wave. You mentioned this huge wave of millions of mortgage-ready folks under 45 who uh, part of this big millennial generation cohort, most of whom are still not yet homeowners, most of whom kind of want to be buying a home now or in the next few years. And we, we don't have a glut of homes available to sell to them. So on that longer kind of medium term horizon, that's when I go back to the market fundamentals. Say, I don't, don't really know what mortgage rates will be doing in three to five years, but fundamentally there's these millions of Americans who want homes and we don't have millions of homes available to sell to them yet, um, that will kind of sustain the price levels that we have for now. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I definitely think that, you know, a plateau, maybe a little pullback in pricing is not unexpected in this environment. Um, a lot of the builders I talk to, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the price is driven by the cost to build, which is inflationary right now because of the inputs. Uh, going into the home, but you have to price the home correctly. The other thing that is going to come back in in fashion really is using financing uh, to help sell the home. Because at the end of the day, it is payment, it is affordability. What can you be doing to make the home more affordable uh, for the buyers? So Jeff, thank you so much for being on our program. I'd like to thank your crows in the background for also being on our program. Uh, <laughs> Definitely a loud group back there. But uh, no, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you sharing your insights with us on today's housing market and all the other things that you added uh, in. I look forward to speaking to you again, maybe the end of this year. We'll catch up, see what's going on in the market. So from all of us here at the Sales Lab, thank you for listening and have a great day.